Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started with today's webinar. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Our topic is CMMC is coming. Are you ready? And when we first planned this webinar, we didn't have any idea what else was going to be coming. Um, I'm sure that like us here, a lot of you or all of you are dealing with the disruption at a minimum um, and, and maybe worse related to COVID-19. So we just wanna say that our thoughts are gone out to everybody. We know this is a challenging and unprecedented time. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day, maybe locking yourself in the bedroom away from the kids or whatever you had to do in order to join us for this webinar. We really appreciate it. And, you know, we do recognize that some folks may not be able to join us today, or you may not be able to stay on the entire time. Uh, we will be, obviously, we're recording the webinar and we'll be providing a link to the slides and the recording probably about a day or so from now. So look for that later in the week if you didn't get a chance to uh, listen the, the whole way through, or maybe your colleague wasn't able to join, there'll be other opportunities to uh, listen to everything that we talked about here today. So again, thanks for joining. Appreciate you hanging with us. Uh, one more bit of housekeeping. Uh, you know, we represent primarily government contractors here at Polaro Mazza. And obviously contractors like the commercial firms we also represent are really impacted by what's going on with COVID-19. Uh, several of our colleagues are having a webinar tomorrow at two o'clock to talk about the things that contractors can and should be doing to uh, deal with these crazy circumstances. So if you're wondering about what do you do in terms of contract performance or delays, and am I at risk of a termination, and how do I handle my employees, um, I think tomorrow's webinar would be the uh, perfect uh, for you to join into. So if you go to our website at poleramaza.com, you'll find links to register for that webinar. You'll also find information about all the other stuff we're doing to help out government contractors uh, and commercial firms. So there's my smiling face. Uh, I'm not quite as uh, dapper today here in our... Uh, casual telework environment, but uh, I am a partner in uh, the government contracts group here at Polera Maza, and I represent contractors and a wide variety of uh, issues that they encounter working with the federal government. Four to five years ago, I started paying attention to cybersecurity. I was, the DOD in particular was developing new rules around it. It seemed to be a growing area that we were getting questions about from our clients. And certainly within the last couple of years, last year really in particular, the pace of the changes and the requirements, uh, et cetera, has really increased. And I think as a response to that, we at the firm here have started a new practice group called the Cybersecurity and Data privacy practice group. And I'm a member of that team. We have several other lawyers here. And this group is helping contractors as well as commercial firms to understand the various ways that cybersecurity requirements are impacting the way we do business, the way we work on federal contracts, the way we have to train and deal with our employees and other contracting partners. Uh, so it, it's a real growing area for us and, and for our client base, and we're glad to be able to serve our clients through this new practice group. Another member of our cybersecurity and data privacy practice group team is joining me here today, Anna Wright. We are practicing social distancing, not, <laughs> notwithstanding uh, this uh, microphone that we're sharing. We're doing everything we can to be safe and smart uh, right now, but Anna is an associate in our firm she works in our government contracts group and has newly joined the cybersecurity and data privacy practice group as well. So I'm real pleased to be joined by her to, uh, today. Okay, so why are we here today? We are here today for uh, CMMC, everything you need to know to understand, are you ready for this new requirement? 
We're going to start by talking about the current cybersecurity landscape, uh, sort of like why are we here, and then we're going to do a deep dive on CMMC, which stands for Cybersecurity Mature, Maturity Model Certification. Uh, it is a new certification from DOD, and uh, we're getting a little message here that the webinar is now full. So if you're seeing that on your screen as well, I apologize, we're going to get rid of that. So again, for everyone that wasn't able to make it in, we will, uh, and, and some questions that have come in, I see from folks that are participating, yes, we are going to make the slides available uh to everyone and the audio after the fact so if you didn't get in or you're having difficulties connecting from home today rest assured we will get this content to you because uh, we want you to know everything you need to know about cmmc so you can decide whether you're ready for it and so that's where we're going to focus in the last third of the presentation on uh what contractors need to be doing to prepare So let's talk a little bit about the landscape, you know, sort of why we are where we are now, what's led up to this. There's been an increasing importance on cybersecurity in the federal space. Like I said, I've been tracking it four or five years. I think it's been gaining momentum for longer than that, but certainly within the last few years, it's hard to avoid the uh, importance of cybersecurity in federal contracting you see on the screen here you know the big number in terms of uh, dollars but also the number of cyber incidents and the negative impact that has on uh, our country the government and our contractors uh, in particular focused in the defense space so dod has really been leading the way uh, on cybersecurity requirements and the emphasis on cybersecurity over the last several years. It's now what they're calling the fourth pillar of DOD acquisition. So just as significant when they're making their buying decisions as cost and schedule, cybersecurity, it's right, it's been elevated so that it's it's a very critical consideration. Um, and we have seen evidence of the, already the fact that DOD and other agencies are putting more of an emphasis on cybersecurity when they're making evaluation and award decisions. So we've we've had clients that have come to us, and not just with DOD solicitations, by the way, we've had some civilian agency solicitations that require offerors, maybe you have to include your cybersecurity plan, what, what we often call a system security plan or an SSP. Maybe you have to provide your SSP in your proposal. We've seen them where the evaluation of the SSP and your cybersecurity practices is rated on an adjectival basis and is part of the best value evaluation. And again, both civilian and DOD agencies. So it is already having a big impact on government procurement, and that's only going to increase. Um, and it's having this impact right now because there are FAR and DFARS provisions right now on the books that are included or should be included in most government contracts that require at least some level of cybersecurity by contractors. So if you're a civilian agency contractor, chances are you have this FAR clause I've got here on the screen, 52204-21 in your contracts. So if you've got that, and we're gonna talk in more detail about these basic safeguards, but if you have that clause in your contracts, you are already expected to be taking certain basic steps towards cybersecurity. So we're, we're gonna get in, in more depth on that as we move along. If you're a DOD contractor, you probably have this DFARS clause here on the screen in your contract, 252-204-7012, which contains more extensive cybersecurity requirements than the FAR does. There's been, a, I think, a pending FAR case for quite a while now that would 
require through the FAR the same level of cybersecurity requirements or similar level of cybersecurity that's currently required in the DFARS. Uh, it hasn't gone through the FAR yet, so uh, we're still waiting on that. But like I said, DOD has been leading the way. So we have these more extensive cybersecurity requirements already in the DFARS uh, that require, among other things, they require compliance with the NIST Special Publication 800-171, which is a series of uh, security controls uh, designed to ensure that contractors have you know, adequate uh, uh, security practices and measures in place. And, and we're just setting the stage here. So we're going to drill down on all of this as we move along. So that's the current landscape. You know, this isn't necessarily new. So for those of you who are hearing about these things for the first time on this webinar, I'm glad you're joining us, but, but this isn't uh, necessarily new, a lot of this. Uh, most of it is probably already in some of your contracts. But the, the issue has been that these requirements in your contracts, the, the clauses that I just mentioned on the bottom of the last slide, they only require self-certification. So essentially what that means is if it's a term in your contract and you're signing up to the contract with the customer, you're telling the customer, I agree to comply with all of these terms. But the customer, most of the time, especially, especially DOD when we're talking about that DFARS clause, they don't have the resources and the time to come in and audit every single contractor to determine if your self-certification is accurate. So it's, you know, it's the honor system, essentially. That's what it's been to this point. And there hasn't been a lot of checking on that to make sure that everybody's uh, living up to the, the honor system. And so that's where CMMC comes into play. We're, we're through the CMMC, we're going to take what has previously been the honor system and we're going to turn it into a required certification. So no more self-certification. You're going to have to go somewhere and get a certificate that says you have CMMC. Um, so, you know, no more honor system. I think that's really the key here. They've been developing the CMMC for a while now, and the final framework for it was just released back at the end of January. And uh, just a bit of housekeeping, we have a slide at the end of the presentation that has links for a lot of different helpful resources, including a link to this final CMMC framework that was released on January 31st. So CMMC is a third party certification. So like I said, just hammering it home here, no more self-certification. And there's gonna be no more close enough, uh, close enough for government work as they say, right? Um, under the current honor system, you could be in compliance even if you're not doing everything you are supposed to be doing under the requirements as long as you have a plan to get there. They call these POAMs. And as long as you have a, a POAM under the current system that says, well, all right, here's where my deficiency is, but I, I'm working on my deficiency and I'm gonna fix it and I'll get there by a particular milestone. Uh, that would be okay under the current honor system. But as we move to CMMC, there are no more plans to get there. When you go to get the certification, you've got to be there. You have to be ready, meeting all of the requirements for the certification. And the objective, you know, big picture is to assess what they call your cybersecurity hygiene. You know, how good of a job are you doing in your IT system? and your internal practices and procedures, your training with your employees, you know, how you're handling your uh, personal devices, et cetera. How good are all of those practices and procedures at cybersecurity, protecting the security of the data that's in your system? And so the goal is to be able to provide an objective 
third party verification because we want to overall we, we want to increase the cybersecurity posture of the defense industrial base you know we're only as strong as our weakest link and that's in the the defense industrial base you know the supply chain so we're going to talk about dod supply chain and you know how uh, we we need everybody in the supply chain to be having good cybersecurity hygiene but there're going to be different levels of that and what the level of cybersecurity hygiene for one firm versus the level of cybersecurity hygiene for a different firm it's going to depend and, and and we're going to drill down on that as we move through so the the slide that is popping up on your screen now is an overview of CMMC. And before I turn it over to Anna to really drill down on the specifics of CMMC, I want to just set the stage a bit further here. So a lot of you on the webinar might have other business system certifications already, like CMMI. So the CMMC is going to be comparable to that. It's a business system certification. They're going to come in and certify your business systems. Um, and they're, they're going to be five different levels of CMMC, level one being the lowest and level five being the highest. And we're emphasizing here again that CMMC is a gatekeeper, meaning if you want to go after DOD contracts, you've got to go through this gate. You have to have CMMC or you will not be able to go after DOD contracts. And that applies whether you're a large business or a small business. Now, we're going to talk as we get later into the presentation about exactly when are you going to need to have CMMC to go after DOD contracts. But if you stay with me here just at the big picture level, the objective of CMMC is that this will be a requirement for all DOD contractors. If you wanna play in the DOD space, you're gonna to have to have CMMC at some level. It's gonna to need to be flowed down to subcontractors and there, we're gonna talk around to that because that's gonna create some interesting issues between primes and subs in terms of you know, what CMMC level applies at the prime contract level versus what CMMC level is required for subcontractors. And that's not necessarily going to be the same answer. Um, see, a, a common misconception about CMMC is that it's only required if you have what's called CUI in your IT system. CUI stands for Controlled Unclassified Information. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that is. Uh, but we want to dispel the misconception here right at the outset. You're going to need CMMC regardless of the information, the type of information that's in your system. If you work with DOD, you're going to need CMMC. Uh, so what level you need will be driven in part by whether you have CUI in your IT system, but it's it's not a question of uh, if you are going to need CMMC at all. You're you're going to need it, and that's really the bottom line. You know, if you work with DOG or if you are in the DOD supply chain, it's not if you need CMMC. The questions you should be asking are what level you're going to need and when you're going to need it. And with that, let me turn it over to Anna to drill down further on CMMC. Right. So John had mentioned the type of information in your IT system and that the level you need will depend on that. So the type of information, I'm using scare quotes here, um, really falls into two buckets of information types. DOD in the CMMC calls it overall DOD sensitive information. It's not classified, but it's still sensitive. And those two buckets of information are federal contract information, which is information provided by or generated for the government under contract not intended for public release. And the second bucket is controlled unclassified information or CUI that we referred to on the previous slide. It's information that requires safeguarding or dissemination controls pursuant to and consistent with laws, regulations, and government-wide policies, but it's not classified. So again, CMMC isn't going to apply to 
a classified system. Well, it might, but it's not meant to grant a certain level of classification to a system. It's only meant to apply to unclassified information, just to clarify that for folks. And, and uh, just so I could step in and answer a question here, somebody asked about whether this applies strictly at the DOD level or if this flows down to segments. This is going to be required across the board at DOD. Right. And so the, this slide is it, it's a nice visualization of how CMMC is built. So on level one, we have basic cyber hygiene that you just perform. Level two is intermediate cyber hygiene that you have documented in the form of a, often a system security plan or an SSP that we mentioned previously. Level three is good cyber hygiene that you are managing across your company. Level four is proactive cybersecurity. Not only are you looking at the current cyber posture of your company, but you're actually going out and looking to see what else is there that I can be doing? And it's reviewed. So you're you're not just keeping track of what you're doing in your company, but you're reviewing it. You're making sure that it's done correctly and improving upon it when you can. Level five, the highest level, is advanced or progressive cybersecurity that you are optimizing across your, con your company. Now, we'll get into this more later, but levels four and five are probably not going to be used for most businesses because you know as you can see they're quite a bit more advanced than a lot of companies are going to need so just if you're a small business don't don't look at this and get scared like oh no am i gonna have to do all this advanced cybersecurity? am i gonna have to optimize all these things no not necessarily it depends on the type of information you need to handle And this next slide just shows the CMMC domains. Um, just gives you a quick overview of what all are the areas you're going to need to be concerned about when you're going for certification. Uh, we can get through that one pretty quickly. Sure. Because the next slide explains what domains are. So domains are broad categories of cybersecurity controls. They're, again, buckets that you can sort things into. Capabilities fall within those domains. They are subcategories of technical ability. And then practices are the actual specific activities that you perform to support those capabilities and those domains. And the practices are what the certifiers are going to be measuring. So just because you say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm supporting XYZ domain. No, no, that's not gonna work. You're gonna have to do the specific practice that is prescribed in the CMMC for that domain or that capability or whatever. Processes are, there are five processes. There were two slides ago, they showed those. Uh, it's documentation, management, review, and optimization of cybersecurity activities that you perform. Basically, processes are the extent to which cybersecurity is embedded in your organization. So examples of that would include your company's policies, employee handbooks, again, SSPs, any procedures that you draft across your company to ensure that you are performing your cybersecurity hygiene properly. Yeah, and let me, while we're waiting for the next slide to load up here, just answer a couple questions that have come in. Um, somebody asked if you have ISO certification, how easy will it be to get CMMC certification? Well, we don't know for sure uh, because it depends on what level you're going for. We are going to drill down and you see the slide that should be loaded up here now is on level one. Anna is going to go through an overview of the requirements for each of the five levels for CMMC. And then we're going to start talking about the certification process as much as we know. And somebody else here asked, can you tell us before the end of the webinar what Polera Mazza can do to help us get through this? Well, I am glad you asked because we, <laughs> we absolutely will tell you that before we get to the webinar. And please hang in for the rest of the hour. And we're going to, that's the, the back third of this webinar is for after we've told you maybe more than you ever wanted to know about cybersecurity and CMMC we're gonna start talking about what it is that we think that folks need to be doing to be prepared for this. 
Um, and I do appreciate everybody who's been submitting comments or questions about the loss of sound or the slides not scrolling through. I suspect that those are one-off issues with your internet connections because by and large, the 500 plus people we have on here seem to be doing okay. So I apologize for anybody that's having connectivity issues. Like I said at the outset, we're gonna make this audio available for everyone after the fact. So you'll be able to uh, get get all the great content here that Anna is sharing. And Anna, why don't you tell them specifically about level one? All right, so level one is intended to be the basic fundamental requirements that anybody should be able to fulfill. So level one is meant to be applicable to the majority of DOD contractors and particularly to be easily attainable for all small businesses. Level one will be appropriate if you only handle FCI, but you won't be eligible to have CUI on your system if you just have level one certification. Now there are 17 uh, required practices at level one, and they track the practices that are already certified, that you're self-certifying to in FAR 52204-21, which John mentioned previously. So those practices include things like using a spam filter for your emails, um, installing and enabling your antivirus software that actually knocks out three of the practices if you just install and enable auto updates and auto scans of your antivirus software. Uh, requiring usernames and passwords to log on to company systems so Joe Schmo off the street can't just waltz into your organization and hop on your computer and access federal information. Um, internally limiting who has access to information so beyond Joe Schmo just coming in off the street, you also don't want Jane and shipping to be able to access uh, Tom's payroll information. Um, and then of course, escort your visitors to prevent unauthorized access to your system. So, you know, install locks on your doors, make sure, again, Joe Schmo off the street doesn't just wander in and wreak havoc in your system. Yeah, I mean, level one really is the basics and, and we're gonna talk about this uh as we move forward i mean th this is the the bare minimum that everybody needs to have um it's going to apply regardless of the type of industry that you're in so we've gotten some questions about uh depending on the industry you know if i'm in manufacturing versus in it versus something else um it's gonna apply regardless of industry. This is the bare minimum, but this is really basic stuff that like Anna said, and I mentioned earlier, is already included for civilian agencies too in this FAR clause. And it's not expected to be very time consuming or complicated or expensive to implement level one. And that's why we're focused, one of the things that we're helping contractors to do is make sure they're level one ready. We, we really want folks to, that's one of your main takeaways is that you wanna make sure at a minimum you are level one ready. You might be surprised if you go uh, through the readiness assessment with us that you're already there or you're not too far away. I mean, you can see like use of spam filters and antivirus software. I mean, we're probably talking about things that you're already doing and maybe you just need to fill in a few gaps and you're there. So I wouldn't be too daunted by level one. Uh, and that's the level that is probably going to be the, the necessary level for most DOD contractors. But let's keep talking about the different levels. Now, one thing I, one thing I do want to clear up, I'm seeing a lot of questions about NIST. NIST and CMMC are two different things, which you probably know already, but that's important because while CMMC does draw from various NIST standards, it's not quote unquote bound by those standards. So when you're going for a CMMC certification, they're only going to be looking at how well you apply or how well you qualify for CMMC. They're not going to be going, oh, well, you know, you, you hit these CMMC practices, that's fine, but you didn't fully get to all of these um you know NIST 800-53 standards so you know we're not going to certify you that's not how that works they're just going to be looking at cmmc so just to clear that up level two certification 
requires you to document your practices and policies. So again, this is where your SSP comes in. It's intended to help small businesses progress from level one to level three. Like level one, you won't be allowed to handle CUI if you have a level two certification. But there's a significant increase in required practices to get from level one to level two. So, you know, something we've been asking ourselves. Yeah. Here why? Is, why would anybody go for level two? That, yeah, that's what's the point? There's that's so much more work. And you don't get anything else. That's my big question, right? It sort of feels like if you don't have CUI and the nature of the work that you're doing, the programs you're on, et cetera, is such that all you need is a level one, then I think you'd be happy to stay at level one. And if you have to take a step up in the security practices that you employ because of the nature of your programs and the information you have, et cetera, then why not focus on getting to level three? Uh, level two is not too far away from level three. And really, I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the contracts mm -hmm. are going to go level three. I it, it, it seems unlikely to me that we're going to see contracts put out under level two. So I think level two is going to end up being a no man's land uh, in between level one and level three. But we have to see how this plays out. Yeah, I, I suspect it's going to be the bucket you fall into if you don't quite hit level three, but you're better than level two, level one. So with that, level three, as John noted, it's expected to be the requirement for most DOD prime contracts. And remember, as John said previously, just because something is required on the prime level doesn't necessarily mean that the same requirement is going to flow down to the sub level. That's gonna be, have to be something that will be negotiated amongst the prime and the sub, maybe talk to the government, see like what exactly you need to do. We Because this isn't fully, rolled out yet we don't necessarily know how it's going to work practically but we do know that just just because it's required at the prime level doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be required at the sub level and now i'd said previously um cmmc and nist are two different things but cmmc does still draw from nist in particular cmmc level three is roughly analogous to full compliance with all of the controls in NIST SP 800-171. These controls you really should already be compliant with if you have DFARS 252-204-7012 incorporated into any of your contracts. The difference is now someone else is going to be certifying you about this. You can't self-certify anymore. And as we noted, yeah, it's a step up from level two. Now you're managing your cybersecurity and it's necessary if you handle any CUI. I did see a question earlier about how do you tell if something is CUI? Great question. There's a CUI registry that tells you what is and is not CUI. We actually provide a link to that on the last slide here, or the second to last slide, I believe. Um, and then now the, the difference between documented and managed cybersecurity is somewhat nuanced. Um, of course, both require documentation as a threshold level. But for level two documentation, you're looking for like a high level policy statement, basic plans for your folks who are responsible for compliance. So especially like your IT personnel, people like that managed at level three means you have that level two documentation, plus you have a mission statement, SMART goals. SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and timely goals, uh, training objectives, keeping track of different personnel skills, what funding you have, any tools you might have that will help with your cyber posture. Basically, you are being methodical about how you institutionalize your cybersecurity. And now examples of level three practices are things like using FIPS validated encryption modules to store sensitive information, uh, blocking your company's computers from accessing known malicious websites, as separating individual duties to avoid conflicts of interest. Um, now, quite a few of you probably have ended up seeing conflicts of interest out in the wild. It's the same thing, just in a cyber setting. So if you have Joe building your system, you don't want Joe to test your system. You want Tim to test your system so that you don't have any flaws in the system, whether intentional or otherwise. You also need to keep abreast of cyber threat intelligence information and update your threat profiles, your vulnerability scans and risk assessments 
this is something that happens a lot of times with uh, antivirus software. So you might end up doing some of this as level one too. But the point is with level three, you're taking it a step further so that you'll be able to adequately protect that CUI that might be on your system. And at level three in particular, employee training will be critical because your employees are your biggest asset, but they're also potentially your biggest weakness. And you need to be able to show that you're actively keeping your employees apprised of these overarching policies, your different directives, and you're making sure they know what they're personally responsible for so that they don't make a silly mistake. In levels four and five, you know, as we noted previously, they're probably not gonna be applicable to most folks in the DOD space. Level four uh, requires companies to review and measure practices, take corrective action, and make sure that they're higher level management within the company of status and issues on recurring basis. So making sure that you're constantly giving status updates to upper management in your company. Level five requires all of that, plus standardizing and optimizing the process across your entire organization. And you know, as, as we said, levels four and five are only required when there is a high likelihood of advanced persistent threats or APTs as CMMC likes to call them, which means it's probably not gonna be applicable to most defense industrial based contractors just because most small companies in particular aren't probably going to be targets of any of these advanced persistent threats. But a high profile, well-known company that everybody knows has DOD information on their systems, yeah, they're, they're gonna have a bit of a target painted on their back. So that's where level four and five would come into play. Yeah, I think we're not expecting the majority uh, based on the data that the DOD has been putting out. Uh, we're not expecting the majority of contractors to have to be at the level four and five. So I, I think you're going to see most contractors need to be at either level one or at level three. And you know, based on a question that came in, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, but it, it bears um, emphasizing that you know, we want you to focus on which level you need to be at because these are gonna be requirements in contracts. That's, that's where the requirement's gonna originate from. So when are we gonna see it in, con, in DOD contracts? So that's, that's the big question. And they, they said when they announced the final framework back at the end of January, that they're gonna take a crawl, walk, run approach. So that means that this year they're targeting what I've heard is 10, what they're calling Pathfinder programs. Um, and uh, these Pathfinder programs will be kind of the pilot, you know, the test case for rolling out CMMC. And they're looking at priority programs like nuclear modernization and missile defense. So that's for this year. And then starting in the next fiscal year through fiscal year 25, the DOD is estimating a phased rollout. And you can see here on the screen the number of DOD contracts that they're expecting to require CMMC uh, in each of those fiscal years. So you can kind of get a sense as the numbers go up of that crawl, walk, run approach. And then by fiscal year 26, CMMC is required for all DOD contracts. So it, it is potentially a fairly long horizon for you, depending on where you fall with your particular DOD contracts and when they're up for recompete. You know, if you're a subcontractor and you work with primes, you know, what programs are your primes on? If you're working on what would be considered these really critical priority programs, then you you may be looking at a nearer term certification requirement. Um, if you're working on a certain other, maybe less critical, less priority programs that were just awarded, say, uh, last year and aren't going to recompete again until fiscal year 24, 25, something like that, uh, then you may have a fairly long horizon until you need to 
to worry about CMMC. So that's that's a big unknown right now. I mean, no, nobody has the answer for when exactly you're going to need CMMC, I, I guess, except for those firms that might be on the, the quote unquote pathfinder programs that know this is coming really soon. The, this is on your slide now, an estimate of the number of firms that DOD uh, thinks is going to have or need CMMC during each fiscal year. So you, again, you can see a significant ramp up uh, along the way, starting though with a relatively low number of, of contractors. And they're estimating that greater than 50% of certified firms will be at level one. And in particular for small businesses, the idea is that most will be okay at level one. That's not a guarantee. I mean, that does remain to be seen if that's how it's gonna play out. But based on DOD's estimates and their objective for level one, the hope is that most firms especially small businesses will be okay at level one. Uh, there's gonna need to be a new DFARS clause that is uh, first created and then added to uh, contracts and recompetes. There's no plan at this point to add DFARS addressing CMMC into, new, into existing contracts. So if you're on a contract that has, you know, it was just awarded last week and it's gonna go for five more years, it doesn't include the, the CMMC DFARS clause right now because that DFARS clause hasn't been written yet. We might have that DFARS clause, we should later this year, if they're gonna start putting it into contracts later this year, then we should have that DFARS clause at some point later this year. But they're not, they have no plans to issue amendments to existing contracts to add the requirement. So if you have a contract that was just awarded last week and it's not going to be recompeted for five years, then the soonest the CMMC DFARS clause would be included in that contract would be for that recompete in five years. Uh, and, and so that's part of what we have to all be figuring out when you're looking at your programs and the timelines assessing when you're going to need it. Um, and we're going to talk more about that as we get into our recommendations here. But the next slide loading up here, how do you get it? So this is another big unknown. And we've gotten a number of questions asking about this. I certainly understand this would be one of my primary questions if I was a DOD contractor. Uh, or, or even a civilian contractor, because some people have asked, you know, do we see agencies in the civilian realm uh, requiring CMMC? And I think that's a possibility. Everything I've heard is that it could very well, like agencies like DHS are kind of watching to see how this unfolds, and it, it could, I think, fairly readily be expanded to cover all of uh, the contractor base, civilian and DOD. I mean, of course, there'd be challenges on the administrative side, just the certifications for all those firms. But just in, in terms of the requirements, I mean, like I mentioned, the level one requirements are, are essentially already imposed on civilian agency contractors through the FAR. Uh, so I, I do think it's possible that if, if this takes hold well on the DOD side that it will be replicated beyond DOD. But right now it's only DOD. I mean, there's no public uh, plans that I've heard of to take it beyond DOD. So uh, this does only apply if you are working in the DOD space right now. And we don't know what to tell you in terms of when you'll be able to get it. I mean, I, I, I do know that you'll get it by going to a third party certifier and they have a great acronym because that's exactly what we needed was more acronyms, a C3 PAOs. I, for the Star Wars fans out there, that one always makes me smile a little bit. So eventually you are going to go to C3 PAOs to get your certification, but we do not know who they are yet. They don't exist at this moment. There is an accreditation body that was formed earlier this year, and they're in the process of 
uh, accrediting 3PAOs, C3PAOs. And we should hopefully see those third-party assessment organizations up and running by the summer, because if they're gonna have to certify firms this year, they're, we're gonna need to get them up and running. I mean, of course, all of this could slip based on COVID-19. You know, I mean, if we if we can't get certifiers up and running and then certifiers have challenges in doing the certifications and the application process is slowed down because everybody's teleworking for a while, then I could certainly see there being some slippage in this schedule. But the the plan pre-virus uh, outbreak was that we'd see these third-party assessors up and running by spring, summer this year, and then contractors would be able to start applying for CMMC. But something else we don't know yet about the application process is whether everybody's going to be able to show up on day one and start applying. I think they're rightfully concerned about a deluge, you know, of uh, people rushing. It's kind of like what's going on with toilet paper and bread right now. You've got like everybody lining up, ready to get their CMMC on day one. There just aren't going to be enough certifiers and enough hours in the day to get everybody certified. So I think it's possible that they will say, we're only taking applications in the beginning from the firms that need to have the certification based on the requirements of these Pathfinder programs that they're on and the primes that they're working with. And if you are just someone that is an early adopter, you know, you're ahead of the curve, uh, but your contracts aren't going to require CMMC anytime real soon, I think it's very possible that they will not uh, take your application, at least not in the early stages when they're still trying to get this off the ground. Um, it, it, whenever you can apply, you'll, you'll be able to request up to the level that you think you're ready for. And that's the highest certification you would receive. You may not get it if they don't agree. Plus, for example, if you went for level three, they don't think you're ready for it. You could get a level one or a level two, uh, but you would definitely not get higher than level three. Uh, so, um, you know, understanding what level you need for your contracts and for the companies that you work with is going to be a really important part of what you need to be doing at this point, because then you you have to aim towards that level of certification when it comes time for you to, to submit your application. The certification is expected to be good for three years, so that's nice, we'll, you know, uh, uh, stretch out the pain a little bit so we won't have to repeat this process too regularly. Uh, but, you know, we really just do not know how long it's gonna take to go through the certification process. We don't know the costs of certification at this point. I know at least for level one, the expectation or or hope is that it's going to be a fairly simple and inexpensive certification process. I don't think that will be the case for level three, which which is a more complicated uh, readiness uh, plan, but also for the, I assume it will be for the certification process as well. So that's still, needs to be fleshed out. Same with, you know, what happens if your application's denied and you don't agree with the denial? How are we gonna handle uh, appeals? Uh, and what role, if any, is DOD gonna have in that process? I, I suspect none because they're, they're uh, farming this out to the accreditation body, uh, but it just raises some interesting questions because DOD is requiring you to have this certification. They're telling you to go to these third parties to get it. So what's your recourse if you don't like the outcome of that process? We're, we're gonna have to see how that develops. Okay, so with that uh, sort of as the baseline of why we're here and what is CMMC, the overview of the different levels and uh, when we might be able to get it, when you might need it, now we're going to spend the last several slides talking about what we think you should be doing to prepare and what we're telling contractors in our cybersecurity and data privacy practice group, how, how we're helping them already. So we don't want you to wait until the last minute. Begin preparing now. Uh, you know, even if 
you think that your contracts aren't likely to have CMMC included until a recompete in 2024 or something like that. The reality is you likely already are subject to these requirements in your current contracts. And you are making representations when you go after those contracts, when you submit requests for payment on those contracts that you're in compliance. So if this is the first time you're hearing about the fact that there might be cybersecurity requirements already in your contract, we should talk about what you need to do to get where, where you need to be today. And the nice thing is that whatever you need to do compliance-wise today very well will set you up to get CMMC once they're ready to start certifying you. Because if it's the level one, the basic safeguards in the FAR, uh, they line up very well. If you are subject to the DFARS clause 7012 and you need to be NIST 800-171 compliant, well, like Anna said, being NIST 800-171 compliant, it's going to set you up really well to get a CMMC level three. So taking those steps now is going to help you from a compliance standpoint at this moment, but also preparing you for CMMC. We want everybody to be wary of scams because there are a lot of emails that clients are forwarding to us where some fly by night is offering for a fee to give you a cmmc certification there is nobody out there right now who can give you a cmmc certificate now there are certainly firms and we as a law firm are working with our clients to help them with readiness assessments to understand, okay, everything that we know about the CMMC requirements today, how close are you to being ready? And I think that's a very prudent step to take, but don't let somebody sell you a certificate because that doesn't exist right now. And so start by answering these questions that we've got up on the slide here. You know, Have this discussion internally, and maybe you're just talking to yourself if you're a very small business or... <laughs> which you probably do a lot, or maybe you're talking with your CTO and your CIO and other folks like that to ask these questions. Do you work with DOD or in the DOD supply chain? If the answer is yes, CMMC has to be on your radar. If not, then maybe you're thinking about it on a longer term view, but, but focusing on, well, what are, the con what are the requirements that might already be in my contracts with civilian agencies? Do you have FCI or CUI in your network? That question is helping you to figure out, well, what level am I likely to need? And what, you know, what programs are, am I on? And what kind of information do those programs require me to have in, in my networks? That's going to drive what level of certification you're going to need. And who are your primes? And what are they saying about CMMC? Um, you know, having conversations with them and how near term of an issue it might be for the primes you're working with is really important. And then understanding internally, you know, what other recompetes you have, new contracts you're expecting for your key programs, the timelines, you know, when do they expect it to go to recompete? And then how close are you to level one or level three? I think for the vast majority of the people listening, Level one or level three is going to be your choice. And, and it's, it, you know, unlikely to be two, four or five for most of you. And because level one is the baseline, it's the minimum, I should say minimum, the bare minimum requirement. And it's going to be required for all DOD contractors. Our primary recommendation to folks is to get level one ready now. Don't wait. Make sure you, at a minimum, have locked up level one. Level one may not be all you need. I mean, that is correct. And from a lot of the questions coming in, I completely agree. You're going to have to see how your primes and your, your contracting officers, you know, what requirements are they going to put into your contracts, but we know it's not going to be less than level one if you're a DOD contractor. And it's not hard to do. Uh, it, it's already required of you in the FAR. It should be relatively easy. It shouldn't be expensive. My guess is that all, that many of you are already level one compliant or pretty darn close if you just made a few tweaks. So we're doing a lot of level one 
readiness assessments right now. I think that's the primary means that we're helping, especially small businesses, which make up a big part of our client base to understand. And we have a, a questionnaire, sort of a, a process that we take you through. What are you doing right now? Um, and what do you need to be doing to get level one ready? And, and you know, what processes and procedures do you need to implement to make sure that you're there? We just want to make sure that you have a level one plan to, to get there. Uh, and that's something that we're helping a lot of firms with. So I, I hope that's one of your key takeaways to get level one ready at a minimum. Just to clarify for everyone, remember that all levels require third party certification. I see we had a question about which levels will, will require certification. If you want any level of CMMC certification, you will have to talk to a third party certifier. Yeah, that's a great point. We cannot certify you. Nobody can, right now can certify you to level one. What, what we can do is help you with an internal assessment of how close are you to being level one ready and put a plan in place to get there so that if you have current requirements, which you probably do in your contracts to to be essentially level one ready, uh, that you're that you're in compliance, and then you'll also be able to more quickly get through the certification process for level one once once the certifiers are up and running. So some other things that we're helping clients to do and that we think is are, are really important for folks now is, Reviewing and updating your employee policies and training, like Anna said, it's so true. Your employees can be your weakest link. They're also your best defense against a lot of cybersecurity issues. So you wanna make sure always that you are a responsible contractor, that you're doing everything that you can to comply with the requirements that apply to you when you're working with the federal government. And a big part of that is making sure your employees understand what they need to be doing. Uh, we want you to focus next on your teaming agreements, your subcontracts, your NDAs, your other agreements with third parties, in particular, the subcontract relationships. And we've gotten some questions around this. You know, there's a real risk here that primes are going to reflexively flow down the same requirements that apply to them at the prime contract level to all their subs. But DOD has made clear that subcontracts do not need to have the same level of CMMC that applies to the prime. So you could have a prime contract under level three or higher, but based on the work you're doing as a subcontractor, it should only require level one for your subcontract. And I think DOD would agree that you don't have to have the same level as a subcontractor, depending on what you're doing. But primes may not all take that approach. They might just kind of go with the shotgun, like we're flowing everything on down and you just have to deal as a subcontractor. So being really careful about flow downs when you're the sub, but also when you're the prime and making sure you're flowing down the right requirements to your subcontractors, really important. Uh, and risk shifting provision. So we mean, you know, the ability to be indemnified by your contracting partner, to be protected from damages that might uh, that you might incur as a result of a cybersecurity breach or a failure to comply with cybersecurity requirements by your contracting partner. You want to make sure most of the teaming agreements and subcontracts we're looking at on programs that include cybersecurity requirements are not doing anything to address the cybersecurity requirements. I just don't think it's filtered into the contracting processes for a lot of firms yet. And this is, you know, maybe for a lot of you still relatively new, but we want to, we really want to work on how this impacts the contracting processes. Consider potential for protests is another area that we're uh, getting a lot of inquiries around. You know, CMMC is not something you would protest yet because it doesn't exist in contracts, but there are cybers, other cybersecurity requirements like 7012 uh, and, and others that are already in contracts. So you, you need to think about how they're being used in evaluation criteria and just their inclusion in the contract. Does that make sense? You know, your competitors are, they're probably gonna go try to get level three, let's say, and then advocate 
that all contracts should come out under level three for the type of work you do. And maybe that's correct, or maybe that's a little bit more than you absolutely need for the type of work that you do, but it's gonna tilt the competitive playing field towards your competitor. And it essentially forces you to go get level three, even though maybe the work that you're doing should only require a level one. Um, I mean, that's, that is a way that protests against solicitations might become more of an issue once CMMC comes online, but we're seeing them already regarding other cybersecurity requirements. And just a note that if you're gonna protest the terms of a solicitation, you have to do that by the proposal due date. There are a lot of available resources out there. You'll see this next slide popping up. Um, I want folks to think about using the All Small Mentor Protege Program and DOD's Mentor Protege Program. See if you can get help as a small business protege from your mentor to get where you need to get to from a cybersecurity standpoint, including CMMC. We've got several questions about joint ventures. Um, I, I'm not aware of any guidance yet on how CMMC is going to apply to joint ventures. A joint venture typically is unpopulated and wouldn't really have systems of its own. It would rely on the IT systems of the joint venture partners. So I think the, the answer should be that in most cases, as long as the partners have the right level of CMMC, the JV itself would not need to have CMMC. But we're gonna have to see how that shakes out as the certification process moves along and it could end up being a solicitation by solicitation issue. All right, so we've gotten to uh, a little bit after three. Uh, thanks for everyone that's hung with us. We've got some key takeaways here. You know, there's there's still a lot more questions than answers. So that's, you know, we'd, we'd give you all the answers on this webinar if we could, but there, <laughs> there's just a lot out there that is still to be determined on CMMC. So we're trying to get the word out, trying to help you understand where it is right now and where we think it might be headed. And we know it's coming, so I mean, the light, in that tunnel, uh, it's uh, it's a train depending on, <laughs> on how well you're getting out ahead of this, uh, because we know if you're working for DOD, especially, it's definitely coming. So we want everyone to be preparing now, at least for level one, get level one ready. We can definitely help. It's not an expensive or difficult process to figure out, are you level one ready or what do you need to do? Get a plan to get there. And if you might need higher than level one, you know, figuring out what you need to do to get there, because that's going to be a little bit of a heavier lift, most likely. And that's one of the main things that we're doing in our data uh, cybersecurity and data privacy practice group is helping people figure out what requirements apply to me. Look at your contracts. What type of work are you doing? Uh, what, and develop compliance strategies around the, the requirements that you're already subject to. Because again, and I hate to be repetitive, but a lot of this is not new. It's been in your contracts maybe for years and is something that you should be paying attention to already. But at least with respect to CMMC, have a readiness assessment, F prepare a plan, understand, am I going for level one? Am I going for level three? If you're level, higher than level three, you're already all over this. I'm not really talking to you. I think, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's the, for the folks that are, have one eye on this or are uninitiated, I think you're most likely looking at level one or level three, figuring out what you need to do to get there, get a plan in place. Like I said before, don't ignore your employees, your handbooks, your internal policies, training your people looking at flow down and teaming agreements and make sure that you're not taking on a greater share of the risk than you should. Make sure you're, you have the right uh, obligations imposed on your contracting partner so that you can enforce the requirements. Don't ignore the boilerplate. We love the boilerplate over here. I know that most people probably don't, but boilerplate, we need to make sure that it covers us for cyber issues and it doesn't in all cases. Um, Look at your solicitations and, and determine if there's something that you need to protest. There's a cyber requirement that's maybe gonna tilt things towards your competitor that you can't comply with. It's gonna restrict competition. 
If you have an incident, we're doing a lot of incident response. We're also training companies on how to handle incidents. I mean, it's becoming a much more regular thing that there was some type of a breach internally and what do we do? And when we work with the companies, uh, then that is that investigation, the work that we're doing and figuring out the response strategy is covered by attorney client privilege. Um, and one last bucket of example of things we're doing is we're working with clients to talk with the government. And that comes up in a variety of ways. It could be that the government is like the CO is imposing a cyber requirement that really shouldn't be imposed, or maybe we need a variance from a requirement that's been included in a contract. Maybe there's been uh, uh, an incident that we need to report. Maybe there's an increased cost of performance driven by a cybersecurity requirement uh, that uh, we have a request for equitable adjustment on. Those are just some examples. So please don't hesitate to call us, uh, Anna or me, and the, the others in our cybersecurity and data privacy practice group if we can help you in these areas as you're working through the big impact that cybersecurity is having in, in federal procurement. And last here on the slide is uh, several helpful links for you on a lot of stuff we've talked about, including the CMMC final guidance. We've got a lot of questions about CUI, you know, what is CUI? And that's uh, something that we, beyond the general definition that Anna gave, we, we didn't drill down on here. Um, I've done a webinar in the past on NIST 800-171 that got into a little bit more detail on CUI. So for those of you that might be interested in drilling down on that further, send me a note and we could get you a link to that webinar. Uh, but there's also a link here on the slides to the CUI registry, which is a website that's very helpful in figuring out what is CUI. So if you're, you really shouldn't be wondering about CUI because it, it, it should be labeled but I realize that that's uh, a fantasy world, not the real world. It's, not, it's oftentimes not labeled. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're having to guess at whether something is CUI, you can talk with your contracting officer. You can, you can contact us. You can also go to the CUI registry. All right, well, we have uh, answered a lot of the questions as we, uh, went through. We didn't save time for questions here at the end. We ran a little bit over and I apologize for that. We, but there are a number of questions we didn't get to. So we'll do our best to answer those uh, individually after the fact. Like I said before, we're going to get the uh, slides and audio recording out to everyone. I do apologize for any technical difficulties you had. I, I understand that the GoToWebinar site has put out an alert saying that they've had extremely high volume. I think this probably driven by all the teleworking that's going on. I know our, our conference call provider was also having similar issues. So thank you all for uh, struggling through it with us and wherever you were today to dial in, we really appreciate it. And if there's anything that we can do in this space, any follow-up questions you have, if, if you want help getting level one ready, or you just have a question about, uh, CUI or uh, want a link to an, an old presentation, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much and have a great day.